Welcome back to Global View. Joining me now from South Africa, Helen Sussman, former opposition parliamentarian and anti-apartheid activist. Mrs. Sussman, thanks for being with us on Global View. I've got to ask you, in 36 years of government, being in government in South Africa, did you ever imagine that you would actually see free elections in which all races could take part? Yes, of course, I was never in government. I know that's an American expression. We would say in opposition to the government in South Africa. And to answer your question, no, I can't say that I ever envisaged the day when I would see apartheid laws scrapped from the statute book and a whole new dispensation coming into existence. Do you feel personally vindicated in some way uh, for your years of uh, fighting apartheid? Well, I'm very obviously delighted to, to see the repeal of all the apartheid legislation that I opposed over those years and criticized very severely, for which I might say I was called subversive and unpatriotic and uh, on one occasion even a vicious little cat by the then Prime Minister. But none of that worried me very much because um, I had convictions and I was very happy to have the opportunity to expose um, all the oppressive legislation which the government was introducing year after year. You know, you've written that the appalling violence in the black townships and elsewhere does not inspire confidence in a stable democratic future for South Africa. What will South Africans do with their democracy now? Will they be able to make the transition? I think so. I think the, uh, certainly the violence is very disturbing and all of us are very worried about the degree of violence that we've experienced in the country, particularly in the black townships. But nevertheless, we believe there's so many plus factors in this country that when the election is over, when tempers are perhaps less violent and when people realize that there is a new and legitimate government in place, one elected by the majority of the inhabitants of this country, I think things will settle down. I'm hopeful they will anyway. There's always a moment of uh, feeling of freedom, a kind of breathing of the freedom when an election like this is finished. Uh, do you think that moment will be brief enough for the government, to s for everything to settle down and uh, for the economy to continue operating and for politics to settle into a, a routine that can, can make a viable nation? Well, you know, funnily enough, even through the worst periods of violence, life continues as before, by and large. Um, you know, people go to work, women do their shopping, and uh, children go to school, and the, the, the buses run. Uh, it isn't as if everything comes to a standstill. And I see no reason why, when the election itself is over, with all the excitement and, uh, that it engenders, people will not settle down quite happily into a normal life again. And, of course, we hope very much that the economy will pick up because what we badly need in South Africa is foreign investment, which will provide the jobs for all the millions of unemployed people, particularly young black people. I've got to ask you what you think ought to happen with the group of whites who still want to have a separate area of South Africa for themselves in the Southern Cape. Should that be allowed to happen after the election, in your view? Well, I don't think they've actually set the borders of where they want their fork start or people's state to be. Um, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to let them try it out. I think they'll soon find it's not viable, that it's very boring, that <laughs> life has taken, <laughs> no really, that uh, all these sort of pleasant uh, urban living that they've been used to um, has disappeared. I think we'll find that most of them will emigrate from the fork start as soon as possible. Tell me a little bit about what it was like to be sitting in Parliament, surrounded as you were on a daily basis there by opposition, uh, people who were opposition to you, obviously they were the majority yes. in the Parliament by far, the Nats. I understand you once said P.W. Botha should only consider going to visit a black township if he came heavily disguised as a human being. Was that the kind of atmosphere that existed in the Parliament? Uh, rather, yes, it was. I must say I came in for a good deal of, of top criticism as well, but I was able to re reply wherever possible. And one thing about um, the South African government under the old regime was that for all its oppressiveness, it did have a very real respect for the institution of parliament, which of course represented, to begin with anyway, only white people and later a small proportion of so-called colored people and Asians, uh, never the blacks. They were ne never allowed to have a vote until now, until the last few years when the whole situation changed and state president de Klerk took over 
and decided he was going to transform South Africa into a democracy. That's taken some doing, actually, and I think cred credit is due to him. Actually, it's something of an irony, isn't it, that you took advantage of that very respect for parliament that you just spoke about, uh, where the whites had this respect for the democratic parliamentary system. You took advantage of that to speak out about conditions in prisons and townships and so on, and in effect turned that respect for parliament against the government itself. Oh, yes, that was my main value of being there, I felt. I mean, I could never... Uh, outvote any of the laws which the government was introducing in this not democratic parliament. Incidentally, I could never outvote them, but I could certainly stand up and through the medium of the press gallery, which was tremendously supportive of me during those years, the English medium press gallery, uh, I was able to convey to the South African public and thereby also to the rest of the world what was happening in the country, and that was very valuable. I was also able to use my position to gain access to places that many other people couldn't get access to, like prisons, which is where I first met Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, by using my uh, position as a member of parliament to demand to go and visit and see what was happening to the so-called political prisoners there. Tell and me, also to visit ahead. townships and so on. Tell me about the time you visited the prison where one of the commandants tried to uh, prevent the prisoners from telling you about the conditions they were suffering. Well, I never really knew about that, but I was told afterwards that uh, you know, <coughs> a fair amount of pressure had been put on them. But I must say, as far as Nelson Mandela and the prisoners on Robben Island were concerned, they were never backward in telling me what was happening there. They were very forthcoming in their revelations, and as a result, I was able to go back to the mainland, see the minister, of uh, justice and tell him that he had to improve conditions or I intended to expose them. You said in your book that Hendrik Vervoort, one of the, uh, the, what you call the ruthless mastermind of the grand apartheid scheme in South yeah. Africa, uh, scared you stiff. What was it about yeah. him that scared you stiff? Well, you know, when somebody is convinced that he has a, a sort of divine mission, which is really the impression that I had of Dr. Vervoort, and that's combined with a fairly formidable intellect it's not easy to combat such a person. And one used to listen to these arguments that he used being built up one after the other, and you, you found, you, yes, there was logic in them, until you realized that they were all based on a false premise. And then you pulled yourself together and were able to oppose what he was saying. Were but you, he was a very formidable debater. Were you ever frightened for your personal safety uh, during those years? Did you ever feel that they might turn against you in a way that would uh, harm you physically? I was threatened quite a lot. I used to get some very nasty phone calls in the dark watches of the night because I always had my name in the phone book thinking that a public representative had to be available to the constituents that he or she was serving. And I got some very abusive letters, all of them very abusive indeed and anti-Semitic, most of them. And I was often told to go back to Russia or go back to Ghana or go back to Israel. In fact, I came from none of those places, but I was always being sent back to them. Speaking of your telephone threats, uh, do you still keep that whistle by your phone? And why did you as have a matter it? Of fact, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I do keep that whistle by two phones, one downstairs and one next to my bedside phone. Well, um, I found it was a very good way to, to combat these people who used to wake me up at two in the morning and tell me what they were going to come and do to me and do about me and so on, and lots of abusive language. And there was no point in getting into an argument, so I used to just blow this very shrill whistle hard down the phone. And it was very effective. Excellent idea. <laughs> there are some people, uh, Mrs. Sussman, who say that, in a way, your presence in the parliament legitimized the apartheid government, that uh, even though you were opposing apartheid, that by being in there, you gave it some legitimacy that it shouldn't have had. What do you, how do you respond to that kind of criticism? Well, I think there is something in that argument, but I think it's offset totally by the usefulness that I could do in, you know, the service that I could give in Parliament, such as exposing what was going on, particularly in times of emergency. We had many states of emergency imposed in South Africa. As a matter of fact, there's still one, I think, in KwaZulu-Natal right now because of the position that existed uh, a few weeks ago there. But, I mean, we had them over from the mid-'80s over and over again, and the press was not allowed to publish what was going on in so-called unrest-related situations. But what I said in Parliament could be reported, so that was very valuable. 
also questions. I used to use the parliamentary device of putting hundreds, literally, of questions on the order paper every session of Parliament, and I used to elicit a lot of information which was used. I might tell you about the very people who criticised me for giving legitimacy to the government by being there. You know, you All the anti-apartheid organisations, for instance. You know, you spent a long time, obviously, fighting apartheid. I'm curious, why did you not, in the course of your time in the Parliament, do anything about sex discrimination in South Africa, which was also a problem? Oh, I did do something about sex discrimination, but it wasn't the major interest in my life because race discrimination was such an issue in South Africa with such obviously oppressive laws on the statute book and so many discriminatory um, uh, ways in which blacks were treated. So that really was my major, my major concern. But I did take part in every debate where gender issues were raised. In fact, I made my maiden speech, which is the first speech that a member makes in Parliament as a new member, was on women's rights or the lack of same in South Africa. And I moved private members' motions asking for commissions of inquiry into the disabilities suffered by women. And I raised women's issues at every possible opportunity. But as I say, women, gender issues were not my major concern. You have been called everything from tireless and dogged to clever and brave, but you've also been called brash and stubborn. And there are some people who point out that you conducted your, uh, your attacks on apartheid from sort of the posh comfort of a, a very comfortable uh, white suburb of Johannesburg. Did you ever feel guilt over that? No, not at all. I mean, it's perfectly true. I'm a privileged white person in South Africa, a sort of middle class, living a very comfortable life, having a lot of pleasure from having a, a nice house and garden and capable domestic staff, which is in, in fact the only way I could have done this job because I had two children when I went into Parliament, a husband and a home, and a job, I might say, which I gave up in order to go to Parliament. So that, uh, you know, I felt that I used my position as well as I could. Now, I never felt guilty about it. People used to say to me, what, you, a liberal, employing black domestic staff? And I thought that was the silliest argument out because everybody I knew all over the world were employing domestic staff if they could afford them and find them, for that matter. And they needed the job, the domestic staff, and I needed their service. So I thought it was a perfectly sensible and logical thing to do. Let me ask you to kind of look through the prism of your own perspective on South Africa, and particularly your perspective on the Afrikaans people. What is it that could have brought a, a persevering people, a pioneering people, uh, a people with quite a bit of smarts, who developed South Africa into a viable economy? What could have led them down this kind of blind alley that turned out to be apartheid? Well, I think it was fear of the domination of a black majority. I mean, the, the demographic picture in South Africa uh, is obvious to anybody that, that it would cause consternation to people who feared black people. And that was really, I think, the, the major reason, because there were only five, th or are only five million whites in South Africa. And um, what, there are something like 30 million black people in South Africa. And that's a big disproportion as far as power is concerned, if power is conceded. But I should point out to you that among South Africa's finest liberals in the past and in the present, in fact, are Afrikaners who have led uh, liberal thought in this country for many years. Thank you very much, Helen Sussman, parliamentarian in South Africa, now retired, for joining us on Global View. In a moment, when Global View continues, I'll return with a page from my reporter's notebook. <laughs>